Outstanding, outstanding. So it's really nice size audience here. I'm kind of impressed with that. I've done a lot of B-sides and, and seeing turnouts like this aren't always always there. I've been in rooms where I had five people show up. So nice turnout. Really appreciate it. So a couple quick questions uh, just to gauge the audience. So how many people here are uh, IT security management people? So we have a few. So and uh, I guess the rest of you are practitioners. Do we have any pen testers here? A couple pen testers. Good. So it gives me an idea of, of the audience. Well, today's presentation is called Out Go the Lights, uh, an enlightening, you like that play of words, enlightening discussion of uh, automated technology or automated security. So this talk is going to be around IoT technology. So let's go ahead and start with me. My name is Daryl Hyland. I work for Rapid7. I hope you don't mind if I walk around. I really, really hate standing behind podiums. I find that horribly boring. So I work for Rapid7. I am the research lead, and my job is to research IoT-based technology. So this, is, this has been really challenging, a real challenge. When I was given this job, one of the first things they asked me was, you know, uh, so now that you're in charge of researching IoT, uh, what is IoT? A and also, you don't have a budget. So, so I've been doing that for about, uh, I've been in IT uh, for about 25 years. I've been in security for about 15, and I was working as a pen tester for the last eight or nine years before taking the role as the research lead for Rapid7. So let's kind of move on. So our agenda today is give you an idea or understanding of IoT, at least from my view, my vision of IoT. It may not be everyone's vision of IoT, but it's mine. And we're going to talk about I IoT migration into the enterprise. We're also going to be talking about uh, lighting automation exploitation. I did some research recently on uh, IoT-based lighting. So, you know, you can say, hey, I seen a guy today with a light bulb in his pocket. And we can also talk about securing IoT best, best practices. How do you approach IoT within the workplace? How do you take care of it? How do you uh, manage the security risk implications associated with IoT within the workplace. So let's start with the Internet of Things. There's a couple, couple interesting things here. When talking about IoT, how do we define IoT? So there's a couple key areas. Interrelated devices. IoT technology has interrelated devices. They collect and share data between them. They do this over a network. This typically can involve Ethernet, Wi-Fi, Zigbee, Z-Wave, some kind of communication they're going to communicate. And then also we get into embedded electronics. They all contain embedded electronics. So this is the base of all definitions when trying to define what IoT is. So this is what I was challenged with doing, defining what IoT is so me as a research lead can figure out what kind of research we're going to do in the area of IoT. And the only way to do that is to properly define what IoT is. But see, this wasn't sufficient enough in my opinion. What we needed to do was look at it from a bigger picture, kind of an ecosystem. So in an ecosystem, of course, we have the network communications. But when we're dealing with IoT technology, there's three other core pieces that make this up. This actually includes mobile applications. It includes the embedded technology. And it also includes the web APIs. And within each one of these, we actually have code running on each one of these that make up the overall IoT structure. And we also have data that's actually exchanged over the network communications to each of these three pieces. So why are we looking at it from this ecosystem type concept? The ultimate goal is, is, is to understand the potential risks, security vulnerabilities that could apply within the IoT environment or ecosystem. And the only way to do that is look at each segment of that, the mobile, the web API and the embedded part of this and how all of them affect each other. Because remember, the security breakdown in any one of these pieces is obviously going to lead to a failure of the overall system. The biggest problem I've seen with most IoT research that I've encountered, it all seems to focus on the actual embedded technology. So everyone's going, oh, I'm looking at a hardware device. I'm looking at an appliance. You know, they look at this. This happens to be a Lightify for a home. This is a home automation for lighting systems. So they look at this and they go, this is IoT. 
The fact is, this is not IoT. This is one piece of IoT. This device here is controlled with a mobile application that is on your phone. That's part of IoT. To do that, it communicates to cloud applications, cloud APIs out on the internet. This will communicate to those cloud APIs. The mobile app will communicate to those cloud APIs, and that's used to control this device, another piece of IoT. And all of those pieces make up the ecosystem. So the failure in any one of these pieces, could somebody compromise a light bulb that could lead to actually compromising your home network? Can someone compromise this? That could lead to compromising the cloud APIs. Could someone compromise the cloud APIs to affect compromise your phone to gain access to your network? The answer is yes. Unless we look at that whole ecosystem, there's no way we could effectively uh, secure IoT technology. So we have to look at it from that standpoint. Does that make sense to everyone? So as we're going through this, I think we've got enough time. If anyone has any questions while we're moving through this, please ask. Don't hesitate to ask. This will make this much more fun and exciting if we have some good questions that come out of this whole presentation. So moving from there, let's talk about each one of these pieces and the potential risk or attack vectors that need to be considered. So when we're looking at mobile, uh, mobile applications, obviously we have the application. We also have the communication that's associated with it. That's going to communicate to the cloud. It may communicate across your network through your Wi-Fi network directly to the device. So we need to look at that type of structure. We got to look at actually what's being stored on your phone. What kind of information related to the IoT ecosystem is being stored on that phone that creates a security issue, a security vulnerability? And last, we got to think about authentication. How do we authenticate to that application on your phone? Is it strong? Is it weak? Can it be compromised? Moving from there, we have the cloud aspect of this, and it's very much similar. When we talk about the cloud APIs, most of the time, this is actually going to be web, a web service. It's available on the internet. And again, we have the similar type of stuff. We have to deal with authentication. How is authentication? So you can buy IoT-based technology. You could deploy it in your home or in your workplace, but if the authentication mechanism is totally flawed within the cloud API, what's the impact of that for your home security or your enterprise security? It could be quite significant. If I can compromise that cloud API, I assume that I can gain access to PII information, critical information about you, your business, or potentially tunnel through that application into your internal network. And that has to be considered. We also have to think about encryption. Is the data flowing from your phone to the cloud API or from the embedded device to the cloud API properly encrypted? Is it passing confidential information, passwords, information, PII information? If it's not encrypted, what's the potential risk there? I just finished up a research project. I wish I could share you the details about it, but we're waiting for the vendors to actually fix the problem. And this turned out that the mobile application that we were looking at, when it communicated to the, uh, to the cloud, it wasn't properly authenticated in the cloud. There was really no good authentication in the cloud. So all I had to do was be able to capture a piece of data, any piece of data about that communication, and was able to use that data to access all the information about this device, you, the person, the PII information, from the cloud because of poor authentication mechanism. And then, of course, we got to deal with uh, I'm, I'm sorry, poor encryption. Uh, then we got to deal with data storage. How is your data actually being stored in the cloud? Is it being stored properly, securely? Those need to be considered. And last of all, but not least, web attacks. Within the cloud API, since they are typically web applications, are they vulnerable to the common web attacks? Can you do cross-site scripting? cross-site request forgery, SQL injection, or a number of other type of attacks that are available during the web stuff. And then we want to get into network communication. All these three pieces, the, the cloud, the mobile app, and the actual embedded device, all communicate via network. So from a research standpoint, uh, ecosystem standpoint, we need to consider all the communication that happens to go over the network. What about the protocols? I mean, like I said, this is a number of different protocols. We're all used to Ethernet. That's pretty common, or Wi-Fi. But now we're seeing communication protocols 
between devices or, uh, you know, the example would be like the light bulb on the network that are using other protocols. This particular light bulb uses a Zigbee protocol. We need to look at all of those communication protocols between the sensors, the embedded devices, the clouds, the other embedded devices on your network, uh, and all these pieces in the mobile applications and that communication. Is it proper? Is it secure? Is it encrypted? And can we attack that? I mean, we have a number of attacks, like the home automation. Uh, there's an attack against the Zigbee protocol, the home automation version of the protocol, because it never rekeys. Plus, someone cracked the key and it's available on the internet. So even though the authentication between this light bulb and that device there is encrypted, it can be replayed because it uses the same key, or it can be decrypted because everyone knows what the key is because it's easily available on the internet, and you go, oh my gosh, it's a light bulb, who cares? Well, the truth is, that's fine if it's in your home. If your neighbor just wants to torment the daylights out of you by turning your lights on and off all day, that's perfectly fine, no harm done. But if you were actually sitting in this room and this whole room was controlled via this technology, which is now hitting the, hitting the market and being implemented, what's the impact of the lights in this room going off? or going on and off. I mean, you say, oh, I would just leave. Well, that's fine, but what about the business? What's the impact to the business? What if you're in a retail business and you can't keep your lights on? What if you happen to be in your uh, place of work trying to do your job and you can't keep the lights on? I mean, most of us are probably like sitting there hovered over a computer wearing a black hoodie anyways, but <laughs> in, gen in, gen in general, the truth is uh, you, you can't function without lights. Okay, so if your security of your lights are bad, at a bare minimum, you've got a denial of service that needs to be considered. So it's, it's kind of a fascinating area to think about. What was that? Yes. Could you say that again? I'd hear it. Oh wow, never even thought about that. So he's basically said that, that uh, there was a, a scam where they would actually call in a bomb scare while they're tr uh, apparently trying on coats or whatever in the bomb scare and everyone run out the door and they stole all the coats. In this case, they just turned off all the lights and walk out the door. So yeah, that's, that's the reality. It's, it, there's a punch, I never even thought about that, but yeah, I guess that's a scam we don't necessarily see in the US. They just walk out the door. They don't bother to care. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes. So his, what he was saying there, if you didn't hear it, was basically by turning lights on and off at 10 hertz, it affects epileptics. Uh, and I know there's been a number of attacks like that, uh, the horrible thing. Someone did that to the epileptic website and made it flash at that frequency. So. Yeah, I, I, I have. <laughs> so you, you've done it? <laughs> Is that from experience? And what was your name? <laughs> Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So yeah, you, you have replay attacks, spoofing attacks against a number of these protocols. And even though it's something simple as the lights, there's a number of possible risk and vulnerabilities that exist there. And again, this is a piece of the overall ecosystem that we need to think about when we're examining IoT technology, that we're not just examining a small piece of it. And the last one is the hardware. This is the part everyone kind of finds fascinating. So you want to you be able to look at uh, the detail of the actual devices. So the circuit board you see up there, I actually cut that out of one of these light bulbs. So that's actually a picture of it. And just so you can get a closer look, I ask that you return it. Here's here. Go ahead and pass that around. So to pass it around the actual circuit board, it was cut out of one of these light bulbs. So we like to examine things at this level here and, and look at the possible security implications. We want to download the firmware code off these devices. Uh, this one here, the actual firmware code was actually brought down 
um, encrypted and uh, was actually stored encrypted too, which was kind of crazy uh, on their technology, all this company's technology. On this case here, it's actually a Zigbee processor that's on the device. And the interesting thing, if you look close at that board, you actually see where the, I think the three black wires that I have on there, those actually connect to uh, UART, a UART, a serial connection. So you can actually hook that up to a computer and watch the device boot up. So, so it gives you a different perspective of what a light bulb is. Very different than what we're used to seeing in the past. It's a piece of technology. It's a computer. It has code on it. That code can be manipulated. There was a talk at Black Hat that I missed, but I was told that it based on mostly on theoretical concept and the theoretic uh, attacks against lights and actually being able to create a worm that could spread through like light bulbs. I think it's doable. It would only take someone a little bit of time to figure out a piece of code that they could put on one of these light bulbs, screw it in when it's incorporated into the ecosystem of that technology, spread through all the lights, potentially doing some of these other nasty attacks that we heard here uh, at will or at random. So it's something to consider. So let's move on. IoT migration into the enterprise. Don't have a lot of slides here, but I have a lot to say about it. So let's start off with, yes, they are here. I don't know if people remember the movie. <laughs> Apparently not. <laughs> okay. So, so IoT technology is in our workplace. I talk to professionals all the time. I go to a lot of conferences, and I ask the question, do you have IoT in your workplace? And most of the time is two things, I don't know or no. The answer is more than likely you do. So let's think about this. Remember we're looking at it as an, as an ecosystem. So we're not looking at it as just some small piece of technology. We're looking at the whole ecosystem and how it connects up. So example, your employee has a Fitbit strapped onto his arm or some other type of wearable technology, okay? That wearable technology connects via Bluetooth low energy typically to his cell phone, okay? And his cell phone has applications on it, mobile apps. It's part of the ecosystem. Those mobile apps, a lot of times, will also connect out to cloud technology, okay? So it ties into the cloud. So we have those three people pieces. We have the embedded technology, we have the mobile technology, and then we have the cloud APIs. Then he walks into your workplace and he attaches to your internal Wi-Fi because you have the whole bring your own device policy, okay? So now, even though you don't believe it or not, that Fitbit or that wearable technology is part of your network because he has it on his wrist, hooked to your phone, connected to your internal Wi-Fi network, connected to the cloud. Now all those three pieces are now part of your network. What's the security implications of that? The scary thing is we don't know yet. We're still so young in this field of understanding what the security implications of such things are of wearable technology and how somebody could abuse those to compromise you. So then we get into lighting. Now think about this, okay? You, you're in a business. Your company, your managers decide they're gonna cut costs and they're gonna put in lighting automation solutions to make the lighting all, all better, okay? So they hire a contractor and they put the lightings in, they hook everything up, they connect it into your network. You know what, I bet you it's probably about a 75% chance they never bothered to tell the IT department that they were actually gonna tap into their network. I've come across this more times than not that IT is often the last people to know with some of these core based technologies such, such as uh, lighting implementation coming into the network. The other one's heating, ventilation, and air conditioning. So when you implement heating, ventilation, air conditioning automation, the IoT based stuff within your environment, a lot of times this is used to manage uh, power consumption within the organization to keep costs down. This may tie back to a corporate headquarters 
It may, it's more likely going to do this through the cloud. More likely you're going to have mobile-based technology involved in this. I've seen these like iPad type things mounted at various locations in a building that are used to control this type of technology within your environment. And that's what gets implemented into your environment. But yet, they don't necessarily tell your IT department. That's not part of the process. IT department does computers, right? They do servers, they do laptops, they do desktops, they do routers, switches, and firewalls. They don't necessarily get involved in the process around lighting or heating, ventilation, and air conditioning systems. Am I correct? Am I wrong? Is anyone going to challenge me? Such silence in there. So how many people have IoT in your workplace now? <laughs> now would you raise your hand before I mention some of those things? Okay, good. Some of, you, some of you said yes, and that, that's perfectly good. So we need to be thinking about these things within your environment. This technology is coming in every day. Now me, when it comes to the definition of IoT, I do not consider routers, switches, and firewalls part of IoT. I know you'll run into a number of definitions of IoT that involve anything that touches the Internet. It is the Internet of Things, so if it touches the Internet, it must be IoT. If that's the case, we've been using IoT since the 90s at least. Uh, and I don't I necessarily agree with that. I think it's part of that ecosystem that I mentioned that actually makes up the IoT-based technology. So power management is another thing. That's another one of those things that I'm just recently getting involved in. I had, uh, I had a company I did some work for had just implemented this type of technology, power management, to actually track the power in their organization. In their case, the IT department vetted the entire technology before it's plugged into the network, which is really good. You don't often see that. That's what I challenge most organizations to do. Get your security people and your IT people involved in some of these type of technologies to make sure it's done right. They actually tested all of the products that they implemented within their organization. And I was up there doing some work for them, had a big discussion about this. And they go, yeah, we implemented uh, a company A, B, and C's technology. It's in all of our store locations all over the United States. What it does is it manages power. What it tells us how much power consumption is being used. It communicates this to the cloud. We could use various applications or mobile applications to interact with it to get this type of information. And we, yeah, yes, we did consider all the security things. They actually went with an Ethernet version of it, which was kind of neat. And then instead of the Wi-Fi, because the Wi-Fi gives you the remote attack capability, um, and you will actually talk about that in a few minutes on some products. Uh, so they went with the Ethernet, and then they also isolated it into a subnet, which toward the end we're going to talk about some of these best practices. Uh, the nice thing was they go, oh, yeah, Daryl, and we actually have a whole spare unit that you can have, and they gave it to me. So that's sitting at my lab at home, uh, actually busted open with a bunch of, uh, probes connected to the circuit board as I'm analyzing the technology. But again, that's one, another one of those technologies that may not be incorporated or IT may not be involved in the thinking process around deploying that type of technology and we need to do that. Now this is the one that always gets me, audio video system. So you go in an organization you go, do you have IoT technology in your environment? And they're like, no, we don't. I pull my cell phone up, I turn on my Bluetooth low energy sniffer, and it lights up like a Christmas tree, and everything says Samsung, Samsung, Samsung. Go into every one of the conference rooms, they got these big TVs on the wall there. And I imagine a lot of you have those in your home too, right? Big, the big smart TVs, they're kind of neat. My wife actually forbids me from putting one in the house. Uh, she doesn't even like going into my office because it's kind of, there's so much IoT stuff plugged in, she doesn't trust anything that goes on in that room. She says, you're not putting one of those in our house. And I'm like, why? She goes, well, I don't want the thing watching us. So you know, and a lot of these TVs actually have video or uh, cameras built into them. They actually watch you and send this stuff off to people. Not all of them, but a lot of them do if you connect it to the internet. They definitely listen to your audio, okay? And that's also transferred off onto the internet if you have the TV connected to the internet. Uh, I know a number of people had these TVs that have turned that technology off. I know other people that the technology on certain TVs they couldn't turn off, and it would continue alerting on the screen that they couldn't connect until they plugged the thing into the ethernet. 
so connected to the internet. So I'm not sure what TVs you have or what TVs you have in your organization, but let's think about that. So you have a TV, it's sitting in a conference room where you have confidential talks and discussions, okay? Is that TV connected to the internet? If it is connected to your network, it's connected to the internet because I'm sure it will find its way there unless you set it up specifically not be able to route. But I know I've been into offices where they go, oh yeah, they fire up their laptop and they connect to this Wi-Fi service in the, in, the ha in the building and they're connected to the TV and they can display anything they want on that TV because it's on their network. So it's on their network, it's on the internet. Now it's communicating, audio, video, out to the internet. Actually, one of the vendors, and I think it was Samsung, actually came out with a statement that says, don't do anything in front of our TV, you wouldn't do in public. So think about that when you're, <laughs> when you're at home, in front of your TV. <laughs> it's watching you, or it could potentially be watching you. So it's something to think about. But it's nothing to be scared about. It's a thing to understand, okay? You don't want to panic over stuff like that. Uh, but if, I, I assure you I'm getting ready to buy a TV. If it has a camera on it, there's going to be a little piece of tape probably over the camera because I, don't, I won't go buy one of those little slide things. I'll just put black tape or something over it so I look weird. But uh, it's something to consider, and something to consider in your corporation. So if you implement these technologies, look to see if they are communicating out to the Internet. Because if they are, the last thing you want to be going out over the Internet, or potentially going out over the Internet, is all the conversation that takes place inside your conference rooms. Obviously, that's typically important meetings, confidential information. Now, these TV manufacturers are not using that data for anything unscrupulous. They're not doing anything illegal. They're not harvesting your data and selling it to people. They're not doing none of this type of stuff. It's all part of uh, this move to be able to market to you better. So they can consume your communications and deliver you commercials seriously in the future that are based on your conversations that you had in front of the TV. I don't like that, but that's kind of one of the goals I see them moving forward to. Uh, but the reality is, is if somebody wants to compromise your network or somebody wants to eavesdrop on you, somebody wants to break in and steal your corporate secrets, how are we going to do that? I know what I would do. I would probably tap into all these TVs you have sitting in the conference rooms. If they happen to have video capability, they happen to have audio capability, why can't I record that information and exfiltrate it off the network out to wherever I'm at and uh, watch you and record you with what you're doing. I think that would probably be the most interesting attack vector I can think of uh, if I was just wanting to monitor you. Does that make sense? So is everyone going to go home and everyone's going to get out the black tape and cut the wires of audio on their TV and do crazy things? Don't do that. Don't, don't do anything crazy. The whole idea is awareness. If you're aware of something, then you can make the right decisions for yourself personally and for your company, and that's what it's all about. It's one of the reasons why I do IoT research. It's never about fear, uncertainty, and despair. It's about knowledge. If we have the right knowledge, we can make the right decisions. So then we're going to get into lighting automation exploits. How much time we got? Okay, good. We got 10 more minutes. Okay, so let's kind of move through this. So automated exploits. Uh, we're going to talk about mobile applications, embedded web, communication protocols, local and direct connect services. So we're going to talk about some of the attacks that I was doing. So let's start with this one, mobile applications. Where I had mentioned that you need to look at the data stored on your mobile applications when you're looking at the ecosystem. Here's a prime example. Here happens to be a uh, iPad, and the plist file actually contains my password and my SSID for my home network. So if I lost my phone and I go get a new phone, truthfully, this data is compromised. Another example, and this is fairly straightforward and simple, but it turns out like uh, with an iPad, you know when you hit the one button to shut the application down? It takes a screenshot of that page. And you know how it shrinks? You see the page shrinking down? The way they simulate that is by taking a screenshot and shrinking the screenshot. And that's actually stored on your machine. So if you happen to be on the configuration page setting the password and you're done, you hit that button, you just made a screenshot. Now the screenshots will overwrite each other over time. But I mean, if you're on doing banking, 
I'm doing banking on my iPad, put in all the stuff, critical information, I shut it down, and I lose my iPad, I leave it in a cab. Hey, the person, all they have to do is pull up this screenshot folder and actually can see what the last page is you looked at before you shut down and actually could leak information. Prime example is the password there. Uh, embedded web attacks, cross-site scripting. Let's just do a demo. It's a lot more, much more fun. But when you're dealing with in embedded technology, and you're dealing with, and you're dealing with uh, IoT technology, most corporate enterprise IoT technologies, just like most corporate enterprise uh, devices on your network, have web servers. They all have web servers. Well, we happen to have a lighting system here. This is a, this is a Lightify enterprise level lighting system. This one hasn't been patched yet, so what I'm going to show you has actually been patched. So I just want to make sure I'm connected up to the right network. So let's go ahead and log on to this device. Not sure how well this will, you'll be able to see this. It's kind of small. This is a configuration page for uh, Osram's lighting system. Like I said, they've patched this. Uh, do not consider this any kind of uh, negative against Osram. Uh, they actually patch this stuff. I work directly with them, helping them find these issues. So these are actually good things. This is a good company. They do things right. They take their security right. They create patches quickly, automatically update the patches on the system. I just prevented this one from doing updates. <laughs> That's the only reason why it's still vulnerable. So if we come down here under management and we look at uh, security logs, in this case, uh, we can see where you've logged on and logged off. That's how the security logs are. It's kind of small, but this is a page of security logs, okay? This case here, uh, let's see if this works. Let's come over here real quick. And here's the actually, you can probably see this a little better. This is the Oswald configuration page. So if you look over here, we're going to go uh, settings, security logs. We can view the security logs here, see them a little better. Uh, you see there's really nothing there. Simple security logs, what we'd expect. But what we're going to do is we're going to actually log on, but we're going to fail log on. So we're going to send it a fail log on. This fail log on is actually going to contain HTML source code, in this case here, uh, which is basically a cross-site scripting. So we log on and it fails. So then if we come over here and refresh this, <laughs> so now his logs are a little more unique. Uh, we're actually able to plant stuff in there. So there's a number of attacks that can be carried out this way. Uh, you can carry out cross-site request forgeries to cause them to reconfigure the device. So this happens to be one vector that we found, which is not necessarily an uncommon vector. It's easy enough to inject um, cross-site scripting via logs, very common method. Uh, but we have another one. I have a video for it. I'm hoping it'll show up okay. This one here is an attack vector, uh, very similar. Uh, it's a video, it's easier to do uh, with a video. But in this case here, instead of a failed logon attempt, we're actually going to start up our own Wi-Fi hotspot 
And for the SSID, we're actually going to put a, a TAC code uh, into it. In this case, it's just going to be a flash file. We're not going to do any real attacks with it, but we're going to show how it's delivered. And it's a similar attack as the other one. We can carry out cross-site scripting. So any device that actually displays SSID structure, we could actually potentially inject cross-site scripting, cross-site request forgery in. So again, we go to the Lightify uh, system here. We're going to come down to the Wi-Fi uh, configuration. We're going to go to the wireless client mode. It's going to come up here in a second. And we can see we have two SSIDs. That one happens to be my home. That one's my neighbor's. But what we're going to do is we're going to fire up our own SSID. In this case, we're actually going to call a flash file. And we can call JavaScript files from a third-party third site to do attacks. But this is what we're going to do. So when this product actually enumerates the wi wireless spots nearby, we'll scan it again so it shows up. Um, this case, something different happens. <laughs> and, and again, again, it's it's a, a fun, entertaining uh, way of actually demonstrating a potential vulnerability in a product. But the reality, this type of attack. Uh, Thing ever going to quit? There we go. So uh, this is just one way to demonstrate the attack. But the reality is, this attack ve vector is pretty serious. Uh, I did a, I spoke at uh, Black Hat Europe here three years ago on this exact topic, where we demoed enterprise level products. And one of the examples we actually used this attack to create a administrative ID on a uh, enterprise level uh, wireless con land controller. Uh, with root level privileges using this attack and also had the device offload all of its configurations to us to a third party website. Uh, so these same attacks can be carried out any other way. So if you happen to be implementing a technology or using a, uh, an embedded IoT based technology where it can see Wi-Fi around you and it's monitored via that, anytime someone would see those SSIDs, the potential for an attack vector existing there uh, does exist. Uh, and again, this is kind of an entertaining way of uh, demonstrating that attack vector, but it's a, a quite serious attack vector. So let's jump back to slides real quick. Uh, so on the last one I'd mentioned uh, is uh, communication protocols, uh, Zigbee, Ethernet, Z-Wave, Wi-Fi, the whole list goes on and on and on. Uh, but the truth is, and, and we mentioned it earlier, these type of protocols can be used to do replay attacks and various things like that. And they exist across a number of these different protocols that needs to be considered. Uh, on the, the Wi-Fi communication on these devices and some other ones, we've been finding a lot of the WPA pre-shared keys that exist on these technologies. By default, you know, they give them WPA2 out of the box uh, set up. They seem to be complex, but they're not complex. Uh, it turns out that we typically are able to crack most of these uh, keys in two to six hours. So if you're using these technologies and using their defaults that come with their products, you need to reconsider that because we're found in the key spaces they're using to generate those keys are insufficient and they're brutable. Uh, and we could easily crack them in, like I said, two to five hours. And if you happen to have one of these devices connected to your network via Ethernet and Wi-Fi, and I'm sitting in a parking lot and I can crack your WPA pre-shared keys on these devices, I am now on your network. Uh, it turns it into an access point, so we can easily pivot into your internal network. So that's something to consider. Also, local connect. The one thing I found out with most IoT technologies, especially the home stuff, is when the cloud goes down, does your whole product quit working? No, it does not quit working. It goes into what we refer to as local mode. So your mobile app will connect straight to the device. But typically, the whole authentication mechanism was your device authenticating to the cloud to get information down, your mobile app connecting to the cloud to get stuff down. But when the cloud fails, that communication drops to local mode, and instantly, there's no longer any authentication. And it happened to be the case with this particular device right here. So the code you see up there, I mean, it's a, a simple piece of code snippet. And, and what we're doing there is, 
literally, uh, we can pass an SSID and our own pre-shared key directly to the device without authentication, and it will de-auth from your network and re-auth to ours without any authentication. And this is not this is not common or uncommon. It's quite common. I've seen a lot of technologies that are built that way. So instantly, I mean, your home network's typically going to be secure. It's probably not going to be a problem. But as you see more of these technologies move into the enterprise environment, those need to be considered. Your network becomes a lot bigger, a lot more people on it. You could have people unfriendlies on it. <laughs> people break into your network. If I can compromise your network and find some technology that I can set up a permanent back door by routing your system out through my system, I'm going to do it. It creates a way for us to move data back and forth without properly not getting detected. So an attacker is definitely going to do that. Now we want to get into security IoT best practices. And we've kind of covered a couple of these. Uh, so stopping right here, the stuff I've showed you guys, do we have any questions? Yes, sir. Oh, the, we haven't looked into it. So the question, the question was, have you seen any um, um, lighting systems used to exfiltrate data off a network? Is that what you're saying, basically? So, uh, and no, I have not seen any of that in the wild, but we were talking about that with my manager just recently. But because when I was at DEF CON, I was in an IoT Village talk, and they were talking about uh, lighting, specifically. And uh, in that case there, they had actually took a, a building a lighting control system and uh, turned the whole front of a building into a video game by using the office lightings. Uh, so it actually played out like a video game using all the office lightings. So, so that brought up the subject with my manager going, hey, you know, someone could use that to actually send data out of a company network. You know, the 40-story building and you have a light on, you know, the 40th floor that goes on and off at a certain rate, is anyone going to notice? Maybe, maybe not. Or have lights come on in various places at different times to actually communicate data out through a building. And so, yeah, it is possible. Uh, I'm not sure. I'm sure someone will eventually try it. Let's be real. <laughs> You know, so that is a possible uh, attack vector. Okay, let's kind of move on to this right here. Best practices, uh, and this is this. These are real simple. This is not rocket science. Identification. You want to go through and make methods to identify IoT technology that's currently in your workplace. How do you do that? This is something I'm currently challenged with trying to figure out from, for Rapid7 is how, how can we help our customers identify IoT if we don't know what they got? If you don't know anything about what's there, is there ways for us to identify IoT? It's something you need to do because you can't protect it if you can't identify it. Uh, business needs. You always need to make business decisions. That's what everything's about. It's not about security. It's about business decisions. The business has to make those decisions. Are we going to em embrace IoT and do it correctly? Or are we going to wait until we wake up one day and something happens and we go, huh, I didn't know I had IoT technology in the workplace? Which is basically what happened to phones. I mean, w did cell phones sneak up on us? No, sort of. Most companies would don't have any cell phone policies until they find out that half their employees' cell phones are connected to their network. And then they go, oh my gosh, maybe we should have a policy. So let's think ahead of that uh, from an IoT perspective and think about what's acceptable, what isn't acceptable from a standpoint of IoT within your corporate environment. Isolate segmentation. Best thing you can do if you're implementing heating, ventilation, air conditioning, power management, lighting systems, don't put those on the core network. Put those on some kind of backbone network so that if it is compromised, they do not compromise your internal network. To me, that's the best way to go. Keep it isolated. Patch management. Anytime you go to purchase an IoT technology, the first thing you need to ask them, how do I patch it? What's the method for patching it? How easy does it patch? The truth is, if I have a technology, and, and uh, the Osram was probably one of the best examples, 
that home lightify system every time a patch comes out I fire up my cell phone or my mobile app to look at my lights to turn them on and off it alerts me that there's a patch all I have to do is go patch a minute later everything's patched it does it over the wire does it over the protocols it patches all my light bulbs does it all that's the type of technology we want if a vendor goes oh yeah yeah you'll have to have an outage and you'll have to take the device and you have to do A, B, or C to get it patched in. But we never patch anyway, so it shouldn't be a problem. You don't want that product. You want a company that takes patching serious and their patching method around uh, upgrading a device's firmware is simple and not complex. If that's not the case, you don't want the product. And any questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, with, with uh, IoT, the IoT technologies I see that I've just started working with myself are like Bluetooth Low Energy. So there is still a number of tools that are coming out uh, for monitoring Bluetooth Low Energy. Uh, there's some hardware like Adafruit puts out a sniffer that you can actually get within the middle of a uh, Bluetooth Low Energy communication. Uh, there's the UberTooth device for sniffing Bluetooth technology. Those are some of the tools for sniffing. There's also a RZ USB device um, with Killer B, which is basically attack tools, but it gives you the ability to sniff Zigbee and capture those protocols. Uh, just recently, there's been stuff come out with uh, Z-Wave, but I've not looked into it. Um, typically, Z-Wave, you're going to use some kind of RF, RF hacker tool or something like that to catch those RF communications. But uh, yeah, unfortunately, unfortunately, there's not a lot of tools uh, readily available. Typically, the technologies are with us longer than I'd like before people start producing valid tools for capturing that data. But from Bluetooth, Bluetooth low energy, there's some good tools out there. Uh, the Zigbee, like I said, the R, and I have one of the devices here if you want to actually see it, one of the little devices for the Zigbee stuff uh, that you can use to capture, replay, uh, dump, do PCAPs and stuff like that so you can actually analyze the data available. And most of these you can also input the data into uh, Wireshark. Uh, the Bluetooth Adafruit sniffer will actually output all the data into Wireshark for further analysis also. And same way with the uh, UberTooth. Any other questions? What's that? Uh, the, the, no, that's not necessarily vulnerability. Uh, you want, you want things to update, uh, but you want them to be signed also. So um, packets, uh, firmware packets should be signed. That means you just can't drop a firmware onto the device automatically. Uh, that's important. But the automatic updates, they don't automatically update. What happens is, is your mobile application plays the pivot point, And when you say update, it pulls those firmware packages down and then serves them up uh, to the actual gateway. And then the gateway deploys them to the light bulbs. Can you hack the phone? In this, ca in this, in this case here, um, all of the packets were encrypted. All the firmware packets were encrypted. I did not know the decryption for them. So you would, you would have to know their encryption mechanism, their signing mechanism, to be able to create a packet to do that. But you got a good point there. Just because a device is automatically updated doesn't mean it's secure. Uh, you can easily update it with your own firmware, then it's not secure. A company has to have good encrypted firmware, uh, and the packets need to be signed. If they don't meet the, those qualifications, they should not be able to be deployed onto the device. So good point. Yes, sir. Uh, no, no. I mean, uh, I mean, let's think about that. Do you think the application community uh, operating system community have a problem with bugs. I mean, Microsoft has a crap load that comes out every month. Bugs aren't going to go away. So, so how did how did Microsoft solve the problem? They solved the problem by putting a good program in to patch. So, and I think that's the case. Now, I agree with some of the bugs are just like you got to be kidding me. Did you even try? Uh, and you're going to run into that in some cases. Uh, and it's kind of a new field. And you got to remember, a number of these companies aren't software companies. 
They've never done software before, so they don't understand security. They've always produced some kind of product, and now they're in, they've decided we're in IoT. So yeah, they're a little bit behind the eight ball, but there's some good companies out there uh, uh, um, build it secure, secure, uh, securely, uh, build it securely, which is the website. Uh, if you look that up, that is a company, or that's an open source, or uh, a nonprofit basically focused on helping vendors build security models around creating and deploying their products. So, yeah. I think we're probably out of time. <laughs> oh, sorry about that.